kill them all. That will stop the spread of this evil. That was the plan used in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago to stop the spread of Christianity. It didn't work. The enemies of Christianity have always used intimidation, threat, force, imprisonment, and death to try to stamp out the church. Welcome to the Bible Study Hour, a radio and internet program with Dr. James Boyce, preparing you to think and act biblically. This week we'll see how persecution doesn't stop the truth of Christ's resurrection, but actually spreads the good news. We'll also meet three very interesting people, Philip, who spread the gospel, Saul, who sought to destroy the church, and Simon the magician, who tried to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's listen as Dr. Boyce teaches from Acts chapter 8. One thing the Lord Jesus Christ told his disciples before the crucifixion and his being taken back to heaven is that after he was gone, the time would come when his enemies would persecute them and even kill them, thinking that by killing them they were doing God a service. I'm sure the apostles and the early disciples remembered that, and yet it still must have been quite a shock to them and a blow to the whole community when Stephen, this outstanding layman and deacon, was martyred for his faith. It was bad enough that he was such a distinguished man, one who had proved himself so pious and strong and effective in his ministry and useful in the church. But in addition to all of that, he was the first one after Jesus Christ himself to die. And the trauma of the loss of Stephen must have spread over the whole church. Moreover, as we find, moving on to chapter 8, the chapter that follows the story of his stoning, that persecution of Stephen, his martyrdom, was only the signal for a wide outbreak of persecution against the church as a whole. Now, there had been persecution before. We've already seen that. The apostles, who had been doing the bulk of the preaching and were the focal point of the church's mission, came into conflict with the Sanhedrin. They called them in. They demanded that they stop preaching. They refused to do it. They released them because they really didn't know how to oppose what they were doing. When they began to preach again, they hauled them in and so on. They finally ended up beating them and threatening them, but again, they let them go. All of that persecution, everything we have seen in the book up to this point, was against the apostles, that is, against the leaders. And now for the first time as we read this, we find that the persecution broke out not only against the leaders of the church, but against the church as a whole. Now suddenly you see everybody is affected. So you have the death of Stephen and now the outbreak of uh, widespread persecution. Moreover, if I could make it even worse, for the first time we find all of the leaders of Judaism united together in opposition. You read it carefully, you'll find out that that wasn't true before this. The apostles, when they were called in, said, we're here because we are preaching the resurrection of Jesus. And the resurrection, as we know, was something in which the Pharisees believed, but the Sadducees did not. So when the apostles said, we're here to preach the resurrection, even though the Pharisees didn't like the idea that it substantiated the claims of Jesus and they were in opposition to Jesus, joining with the Sadducees at that point to try and have Jesus removed. This was nevertheless a point that came as a division between these two bodies, these two groups of leaders in the Jewish nation. Later, years later, the Apostle Paul did the same thing. Because when he was called before the Sanhedrin, he said, it's in the matter of the resurrection that I'm called in question before you this day. And immediately they fell into squabbling between themselves because the Pharisees said there was a resurrection And the Sadducees, who were the modernists of the day, said there was not. But you see, something has happened in the meantime, and what happened was the spread of the gospel among the Hellenists, the election of these Greek-speaking, Greek Christians, 
who were Jews in the sense that they had been sympathetic with Judaism and had entered into the worship of Judaism, but were Greek in background, the spread of the gospel among them, the election of people from their number as leaders in the church, as all the early deacons were, and then especially this great, brilliant sermon of Stephen before the Sanhedrin, just before he was martyred. I pointed out when we were studying that, even though we went through it very quickly and had many, many verses last week, that Stephen, it would seem, was at this point even more perceptive than the apostles, because the apostles were still thinking as Jews. They were still attending the temple worship. They were going through all the rites of Judaism. Later on, this became a problem for them, but at this point, they didn't seem to see any difficulty there at all. But Stephen, the Hellenist, the person with a Greek and not a Jewish background, immediately, it would seem, perceived that all these Judaistic accretions to Christianity were destined to pass away. And he knew well, as Jesus Christ had said would happen, that even the temple itself would pass away. And it was on that ground that he was hauled before the Sanhedrin. That is, he was brought to trial on the same basis that Jesus Christ Christ was brought to trial. And they said of Jesus, he subverts the law, and he's setting about to destroy the temple. And on that point, you see, not just the Sadducees, who were opposed to the resurrection, but the Pharisees too, who were very defensive of the law, were up in arms. You see what I'm saying? At this point of the narrative, things are really getting bad. There's been a martyrdom, Martyrdom has triggered a widespread persecution, and the agents of that persecution now are not only the Sadducees, who are opposed to the doctrine of the resurrection, but the very powerful Pharisaic party as well. And there's one thing more. I suppose at the time, those who were involved didn't quite gain the force of this, but Luke is writing later, and he knows, and his readers are reading it later, and they know that this man, Saul, whom he introduces here as an agent of the persecution, became the first really great deadly enemy of the church. Not much is said about him here. He was simply there, it says, giving approval to his death. But when Luke writes this, you see, he writes it knowing full well that everyone who reads it, as he himself knew, this man, Saul, went on from there. Perhaps we're to understand this. Perhaps he was behind that persecution. At any rate, he channeled it and he intensified it to such an extent that not only were the disciples scattered, as the text says they were, but he actually went after them as they were scattered and was persecuting them, hounding them to death. Now, it says something Interesting about Saul in verse 3. It says, Saul began to destroy the church. He ravished the church is what the word actually means. And it's worth pointing out here. I don't always point out the matter of Greek tenses and such, but that tense of the verb, ravish or destroy, is an imperfect tense. And what that means is he went on ravaging it. He was ravaging it, and he kept on ravaging it. Sometimes I think, as appreciative as I am of the New International Version, that in an attempt to render it in idiomatic English, they lose something, and I think that's what they do here. It says, but Saul began to destroy the church. I think they mean what I mean, but I don't think that quite conveys the idea. It just sounds like Saul started in to make trouble. But the real idea is that he continued to make trouble. He was making trouble, and he continued to make trouble, and he was going to keep making trouble. And the reason I make a point of that, you see, is that as Luke tells the story, all this trouble he was making was ineffective. He was setting out to destroy the church. He was focusing the persecution. He was making sure that it kept going. He was intensifying it. But the more he did it, what? The more the gospel spread. Because those who were persecuted, it says, were scattered throughout all Judea and to Samaria and even beyond, and everywhere they went, they planted the seeds of the gospel. Let me give you another little detail. Verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word. There are different words in the Greek language for scattered. Some words simply mean they were scattered abroad, that's all. It's like you scatter something to the winds and it's gone. Well, that isn't the word that's used here. This word is used in the sense of scattered in order to be planted, you know, in the Hebrew language, there's that great word Jezreel that means that, 
scattered, but also planted. It's what God said he did with Israel. He scattered them, but then he was going to plant them in their land, and the word is the same. The word's Jezreel. Well, that's the case here. The disciples were scattered as a result of the persecution. This is what the leaders intended. Get them out of here. Get them to go into all different areas. Break up this movement that's going on. But all I did by scattering them was plant them in all the places to which they were scattered. And wherever they were planted, it says they preached the word. I guess that's a point at which it's worth pausing to say, is that true of you? Wherever you have found yourself, whether scattered by some intentional means or simply moved because that's the way our society functions, have you actually been planted there? You put down roots, do you bear fruit for Jesus Christ? Do you preach the word? Do you bear the witness? That's what they were to do. You see, if that's the case then even the worst things that happen, as was the case here, actually serve to advance the cause of Christ. You see, Paul later writes in the book of Romans in the 8th chapter, all things work together for good to them that love God. And this is an example of that. Even the persecution, even the stoning of Stephen. You say, yes, but who wants to be stoned? Well, nobody, of course. And who wants to be scattered? Well, most people don't want to be scattered. You say, well, does that work together for good? And the answer is yes. Not always the good as we perceive it, not only is the good that we want, but it works for the good because it's the good of the gospel, the good of the kingdom, and where that prospers, we prosper because we are citizens of that kingdom, and that's the way we need to think about these things. So, as I say, as this chapter begins, we have, on the one hand, This great picture of persecution, intense in all its forms, against the entire church. But on the other hand, we have this marvelous working out of the grace of God as those who are scattered serve only as vehicles of the communication of God's truth. Now, the focus in terms of people changes now, shifts to this man, Philip, the next in line of the distinguished deacons who were elected to chapter 2 before. Stephen was the first, he was eloquent, and he was martyred. Now it would seem the mantle of leadership among this body of the deacons passes to Philip, and he begins to minister in Samaria. Samaria is a word that should ring a bell in our minds at this point, because if we think back to chapter 1, we recall that that was the outline for the expansion of the Christian missionary enterprise that Jesus gave his disciples. He said in Acts 1.8, you'll be my witnesses after the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll bear a witness in Jerusalem. That's what they'd been doing. And then he said in Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the world. When we were looking at that verse way back at the beginning of these studies, I pointed out that those words, Judea and Samaria, are probably to be taken together as speaking of one entity. You see, you could take it is describing four things, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. But I suggested that it's probably Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria, and then the regions beyond. And I say that not only because that's one way in which the text can be read, but because that's the way Luke develops it in the unfolding of the history of the church in the book of Acts. Up to this point, up through the end of chapter 7, you've had the preaching of the gospel in Jerusalem. And it had been very effective. Thousands had believed. And we're told that Many hundreds flocked into the city in order to be with the apostles and to experience the healings that they were doing in those days. But now in chapter 8, you see, as a result of the persecution, this great change in what had happened, the gospel begins to expand, and the place it expands into is Samaria. Later, we get back to Judea. You see, it's not quite the order you would expect. You'd expect Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and Rome. Instead, you have Jerusalem. Then you have Samaria and Judea, and it suggests that they're to be taken together. At any rate, that's what happens, and Philip, you see, is the instrument of this great missionary outreach. Now, you say at this point here, are the Christian apostles and teachers, the the deacons, going out to carry the gospel to a new region? Certainly, when they go to a new area, they should use new methods. Isn't that What our sociological courses would teach us, you have to understand the people to whom you go, and you have to present things in their categories. This is the time for a great reinterpretation of Christianity as 
We begin to involve Gentiles or half Gentiles, half Jews in Samaria or whatever, and the missionary outreach. Well, that's the way we might think, but when we see Philip going out to preach, we find very explicitly that he does exactly what the apostles and the others have been doing all along. We're told in verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And verse 5 says, Philip, giving a specific example now of those who were scattered abroad, went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ. In other words, he preached the gospel, and the gospel was centered in Jesus Christ, and that's what they'd been doing all along. I was talking about that this morning when we were dealing with Paul's statement of the gospel in Romans 1, 16 and 17. We were talking about why the apostle was not ashamed of the gospel, and we saw that one reason why he wasn't ashamed of it is that it is in the preaching of the gospel that the power of God is known. That's how God has chosen to reach people, through preaching in a formal way and also by extension the testimony of Christian people in all circumstances because that's what's being talked about here. That's where the power of God is known. That's where transformations take place in the preaching of the word, and that's what Philip did. And God blessed it, as we see. People began to believe in this city of Samaria and eventually in other places. The remainder of the chapter goes on to tell us about his ministry to the Ethiopian, which suggests that already now the gospel is expanding beyond Samaria into Africa to the south. It's interesting that Philip is the one who's doing this. As we read this, if you think of evangelism in terms of going out beyond where you are, that is missionary evangelism, Philip is the first missionary evangelist. Later on, he's called an evangelist in the 21st chapter, verse 8, Philip the evangelist. It's the only time in Acts that anybody is specifically called an evangelist. Certainly Paul was, and he was a missionary, but here Philip is called an evangelist. And it's interesting that this man, Philip, was a layman. It's worth reflecting on that, at least I do when I come across something like this. It has always seemed to me when I think in terms of those who have been particularly effective in speaking to others about Christ that generally has been laymen. We don't often think that way. We think that you go into the ministry and one of the things you can do in the ministry is be an evangelist. And certainly there are ministers who are evangelists. But my experience has been that those who are most effective as evangelists are laymen. And I don't think that's an accident, because although it's true that there are some ministers who are evangelists, generally the task of the ministry is not a task of evangelism. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood on that. You can't preach or teach the Bible without it being evangelistic. The Bible always centers in Jesus Christ. You don't understand it unless you understand how it has bearing on him and his message, but chiefly the task of the minister is, as Paul says in Ephesians, to equip the church so the church may do the ministry. And that includes the ministry of evangelism. So a minister's job really is to teach the Bible, and then those who are taught, particularly those who have the gift, the special gift. Now, we should all be witnesses, but those who have a special gift of evangelism are to exercise that in an effective way as they go out to others. At any rate, that's what Philip did. We're not told much about Philip. We don't know where he got his instruction. Perhaps he was even a disciple of the Lord. We don't know that, but it doesn't suggest that. I would think that he had probably learned at the feet of the apostles. They had taught. They had taught as Jesus had taught them. He had learned, and now he took this message that they had taught him, and he was ready to bear it into other places. And oh, God blessed him. It says not only did many hear and believe, And it says that God even blessed him with the ability to do miraculous signs. This is particularly significant in view of the story that follows, because one of the reasons, perhaps the chief reason, that God allowed Philip to do these miracles is for the sake of the impact it had on this man, Simon, who was a miracle worker, a wonder man, but a charlatan, and who had impressed the people of this city of Samaria. This is where the story moves next. It begins to talk about him. And this man, Simon, is really interesting. It's interesting because he's somewhat of a puzzle. We know it's a charlatan. That's the way he's introduced. That is, he fooled people. He had magic tricks. And he went about doing his magic tricks, and as a result of them, they thought that he was some great person. The people 
It says in verse 10, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is the divine power known as the great power. That was a great title he used for himself. It was like Blackstone the Great, Simon the Magnificent. That was the way he styled himself. And he was making a great impact in this city of Samaria until Philip came. And then you see, for the first time in his life, he began to see a power that really did accomplish the things it seemed to accomplish. When Simon was doing his magic tricks, he was just fooling people. And he was well aware of the fact that he was fooling people. Now suddenly, here was Philip, not operating at all the way Philip was operating, not trying to draw attention to himself, but rather speaking of someone else, pointing to Jesus Christ and in the power of this Christ, the power of his spirit, he was healing people, and all these great miracles were being done. Evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed, and there was great joy in that city, something that Simon had never seen before. And in a sort of professional way, Simon was most impressed And he said to himself, if I'm going to advance in my profession, if I'm going to recapture the following, which I've had up until now, I better get this power that Philip has. What makes this so puzzling is verse 13, which says, Simon himself believed and was baptized. And that raises the question, was he actually a believer? Was his baptism a meaningful baptism, or was he just carried along professing something that really hadn't happened in his heart. I suppose the clear disposition is on the side of the fact that he was no true believer, but you can make a case on the other side. If you like to read the commentaries, you'll find that the commentaries always make a case on the other side, even if you don't want to hear it. But that's what they do, and they suggest for some reason that nothing that is said later about him necessarily excludes necessarily excludes the fact that he might have been a true believer. Oh, it is true, Peter says, that he might perish, and that's pretty strong language. But Peter also says, you have no part with us in this. And it's interesting that that is the same phrase that Jesus had used of Peter in the upper room. When Peter had said to Jesus when he wanted to wash his feet, no, you'll never wash my feet. I don't want you to do that. That's improper. Jesus said, unless I wash your feet, you have no part in me. It's the same term, you see, and yet Peter was an unbeliever. He was just out of the will of God. He wasn't understanding things. And it's possible, it's possible that this man, Simon, was a believer, but was just so poorly informed and so bound by the way of thinking that had characterized his life all those years up to that point that he was just way off base here. And Peter was rebuking him as a believer. As I say, that's possible. And yet, as we read it, it would really seem that this was merely a case of one who had been exposed to the preaching, was impressed by the miracles, who wanted to come and be part of it and tap into the blessing, but without that real transformation of the heart that gives evidence of the fact that he'd been born again. You can, of course, apply this either way. If this man, Simon, was saved, really born again, then this is a warning against what in the history of the church has come to be known as simony. That's a term that is based upon his name. It's wanting to buy God's blessings. Think that you're going to get God's blessings because you have sufficient means to pay for them. We think of that as sort of an old-fashioned idea, that idea of simony. We think, oh, that's something that characterized the Middle Ages when people tried to buy papal favors or buy their way to heaven by paying a certain amount to get them out of purgatory. And it's true, that is certainly an illustration of it. But I dare say we have the same thing today. We have that way of thinking today that if you can only raise enough money, somehow you can have the blessing of God. Many, many Christian ministries operate that way. If only you can raise enough money, then we can do all the things that are necessary to be done in order to show that we're really blessed by God in achieving things. And You know, I, as much as other people in organizations, realize that you do need money to do work, and I'm involved in some measure in raising it for a number of different organizations. But, oh, what a tragedy if we ever begin to think that we get the best thing of God by buying it, by how much we have. When God really blesses his church, when revival sweeps over his people, it's always in unexpected ways, and it is never connected with how much money you have. It's just that God chooses to do it 
And so his spirit moves and his people are revived. And from beyond the walls of the church, people throng in because the spirit draws them to find what is happening in that place. And that's what we are so lacking in today. We are rich in things, but poor in soul. And as I say, if this man, Simon, was a true believer, then this is a warning to us about trying to purchase God's favor. On the other hand, if he was no believer, but thought he was, then that's a warning to anybody who thinks that just because you make a proper profession and go through the motions that are expected of Christians, that therefore you're all right. That's something the church needs to hear today. I remember about 20 years ago when I was working for Christianity Today in Washington, Carl Henry, who was really a very effective Christian statesman trying to bring different branches of the church together, did a series of parallel articles accompanied by an editorial in Christianity Today in which he pointed out an anomaly regarding baptism. He said that those who practiced infant baptism were tending to downplay it in their churches because so many disagreed with the practice, while on the other hand, those who believed in adult baptism and not infant baptism were tending to baptize the children earlier and earlier for the sake of gaining new members in the churches in order to satisfy the expectations of the ecclesiastical hierarchy. And now he was a Baptist, and he was talking about Baptist churches. I don't know anything about that aspect of them. That was his judgment, and his point was the two were coming together, but for all the wrong reasons. You see, the point I'm making is that something like that happens in other churches as well. We are often so interested in getting members in our churches that we make the demands for membership almost meaningless. And so as long as a person will come and sort of say a few right things, we say, well, brother, you're all right, be baptized, and they're a member of the church. And then we add them to the rolls, and we say, well, we increased 13% last year, and the year before that we only increased 10%, and things are really going well. And we report this, and we say, well, isn't that great how God is blessing It's not necessarily the work of God that we're doing. I sometimes think that when we treat membership in the church that easily, what we're really doing often is inoculating people against the real thing. You see, they think that because they made a profession and because they've been baptized, it's well with their souls. And actually, they may not be born again. They may still be under the judgment of God. It's interesting to make a comparison between how churches function today in terms of membership and how they did in what was probably the strongest age of the church in America back in the days of Jonathan Edwards when the Puritan movement in this country was strong. Churches were not a large percentage. Their membership was not a large percentage of the country. The membership is greater today in terms of the percentage of the country, but they were strong churches. And someone has pointed out that today if a church has a membership of 2,000 people, They probably know where about 1,000 are and about 500 come to church. But in the days of the Puritans, if they had 500 members, 1,000 were in church, and they were having a profound impact in the lives of 2,000. Now, you see, I perhaps in some way have been wandering a bit astray in this matter of Simon, but I think that's a valid application. Simon came saying, oh, yes, I believe. And he said, I want to be baptized. And so I accepted his profession. After all, we can't see the heart. All we can do is judge on the basis of the profession. That's what Philip did. And he was baptized, but he probably, as I suggest, was not saved. Now, in this discussion he had with Peter after Peter and John were dispatched from Jerusalem to go up to Samaria and see what was going on. He expresses his desire to receive the Holy Spirit, and he says, this is where the idea of Simon comes from, he says, here, I'll give you money if you lay your hands on me so that I may have the power of imparting the Holy Spirit to others. He wanted to be able to do miracles in the Spirit's power, and he was willing to pay for it. The way he was treating the Holy Spirit there is not altogether different from the way many Christian people think about the Holy Spirit in the churches. Many people think about the Holy Spirit as a power, and therefore, if you want to have power in your life, the thing to do is get more of it. Now, they probably aren't suggesting that they pay for it, but there are all sorts of ways of getting it, 
and our churches will tell you how to get it. Certain things you go through, certain things you can do. So this power, this thing, becomes yours, and you can use it to integrate your life, to overcome the problems you have at work, to live victoriously, or whatever it may be. One of the great principles that we have to understand when we're dealing with this doctrine of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not just a power. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is God. And when you get that clearly in your mind, that the Holy Spirit is a person rather than a power, then you see that the object of our relationship to the Holy Spirit is not that we might have more of it so we can use it, but rather that he might have us and use us. And that's what Simon didn't understand, but it's the way the Holy Spirit operates. And the proper contrast between this story in Acts 8 is what you find in the 13th chapter of Acts, just a little bit longer, in verse 3, where it says, while the disciples were worshiping in Antioch and were fasting, the Holy Spirit said, and the Holy Spirit is taking charge, the Holy Spirit says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. And at this point is the result of the direction of the Holy Spirit, the great missionary expansion of the church through the Apostle Paul commences. Think about that. When you think about the third person of the Trinity, do you think of him as a power that somehow you should get and use? Or do you think of him as God, the one who should have you and use you? Well, I come to the end of this story, and the point at which it ends is with Peter's words to Simon. Peter tells Simon, repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart, for I can see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. And Simon says, pray to the Lord for me. I ask the question, how does that sound in your ears? Pray to the Lord for me. Does that sound pious? That's the sort of thing ministers hear all the time. You talk to somebody and they say, well, pray for me, pray for me. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood. It's good to pray for people. And if somebody says to me, well, pray for me, I try to do that. I don't always write it down and remember to pray for them all the time, but I try to pray for them on the spot or immediately afterwards and try to acknowledge that request. If they say pray for me, I do. But the point I want to make here, you see, is that Simon, according to Peter's judgment, was caught up in wickedness, captive to sin, full of bitterness, and Peter's words to Simon were, repent of the wickedness and pray to God. That is, you pray, repent of your wickedness and pray. And so at that point, for Simon to say to Peter, well, you pray for me, pray for me, is not a pious thing at all, but what we would call in colloquial English a cop-out. He was refusing to do what he should do and was passing the buck to Peter. Do you do that with other people? Do you pass the buck? Do you pass the buck to your elder? Do you pass the buck to your friend? Do you pass the buck to your minister? Lots of people pass it to me. They think somehow I should solve all their problems. And I can't do it. I can't even solve my own, let alone solve all of their problems. You see, that's not what Peter says. Peter says, if you're sinning, it's up to you to repent of the sin. And if there's prayer needed, you are the one who above all should pray. And in that order... You see, you don't come to God with your sin and say, now I want you to do certain things for me. The Bible says your iniquities have separated between you and your God. That's why his ear is heavy and he cannot hear. It's not that his ear is heavy in itself or his arm is weak that it cannot say, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. If you come cherishing sin in your heart, it's just sacrilege, blasphemy to think that you can claim the promises of God. Come, solve all my problems. It doesn't work that way. And you see, if you come repenting of the sin, if you say, oh, like the prodigal son, I've sinned against heaven and against you, sinned against God and against others as well, because sin always affects other people. If you come acknowledging that and then praying and praying as the publican did, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Well, as Peter says, who can tell but that God will forgive you cleanse you and restore you and save your soul.
You see, it's no accident that here at the very beginning of this section of Acts that tells us of the expansion of the gospel beyond Jerusalem into Samaria and the regions beyond, it brings in this story of the man Simon in order that we might ask, are we like that? Have we believed in word only? Or has God changed our hearts? And if he hasn't changed our hearts, will we repent of our sin? Will we come to him? Will we ask for forgiveness in order that we might find it in Jesus Christ? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of this chapter and indeed all the chapters of this book and this marvelous Bible that we're given, that we're to make our constant meditation day and night. It's to form our way of thinking and guide our lives and form and direct our actions. And Father, we thank you for the teaching of this section that we have studied tonight with all its different applications to the way the church is run and the way the gospel spreads and the message itself and our response to the message. Oh, our Father, don't let it be true. Be gracious to us. Be gracious to each one. Don't let it be true that, that someone here just gives mental assent to this and then goes out and lives wickedly. And our Father, by your Spirit, who is the Spirit of holiness, make clear that the way of Jesus Christ is a way of obedience and purity, a way of holiness and righteousness, and grant a genuine repentance of sin, true faith in Christ, and ability to walk and continue walking in the way everlasting. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen and amen. You're listening to the Bible Study Hour with the Bible teaching of Dr. James Boyce, a listener-supported ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. The Alliance exists to promote a biblical understanding and worldview. Drawing upon the insight and wisdom of Reformed theologians from decades and even centuries gone by, we seek to provide Christian teaching that will equip believers to understand and meet the challenges and opportunities of our time and place. Alliance Broadcasting includes the Bible Study Hour with Dr. James Boyce, Every Last Word with Bible Teacher Dr. Philip Ryken, God's Living Word with Pastor the Rev. Richard Phillips, and Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, featuring Donald Barnhouse. For more information on the Alliance, including a free introductory package for first-time callers, or to make a contribution, please call toll-free 1-800-488-1888. Again, that's 1-800-488-1888. You can also write the Alliance at Box 2000, Philadelphia, PA, 19103. Or you can visit us online at AllianceNet.org. For Canadian gifts, mail those to 237 Rouge Hills Drive, Scarborough, Ontario, M1C2Y9. Ask for your free resource catalog featuring books, audio, commentaries, booklets, videos, and a wealth of other materials from outstanding Reformed teachers and theologians. Thank you again for your continued support and for listening to the Bible Study Hour.